there was a shepherd. And this shepherd had a flock of sheep, maybe 50, maybe 100. It really doesn't matter how many he had. He had a decent amount of sheep, and he loved them all. They were his sheep. And he would make sure at night that they were in the fold, and he would make sure that they had food and water. And he was responsible, obviously, for making sure that when they went out on their day's journeys, that when they went to the, to the grass, he made sure that it was the best grass. When he would take them through valleys, he made sure that they were protected. He had a rod, he had a staff. He was a good shepherd. But this shepherd had a favorite, a favorite little lamb, uh, about six weeks old. And the lamb's name was Joshua. And the shepherd just had been there when Joshua was born. He, had, he was just nurturing him up, and he was the newest of the young lambs. And so, and so the shepherd had just fallen in love with him. He showed him a little bit of extra attention and just making sure that he understood where everything was. But what he wanted the sheep, the little, the little lamb, to understand the most is how important it was for that lamb to follow the shepherd. How important it was for that lamb uh, to, to stay near the shepherd's side for direction, for protection, and all of that. Well, every day the, the shepherd would come out to the fold and he would let the sheep out. And, you know, some of the sheep who, who had known the shepherd for quite some time, some of the sheep who were, who were older and, and more experienced, you know, they would go by the shepherd and he might tap them on the head or pat them. But they were, they were interested in getting out there to the grass, getting out there to what interested them the most. And, but not Joshua, right? Joshua was still in love with the shepherd. Joshua was excited. Joshua would come out of that fold. He would be right there and the shepherd would, would pet him and, and love on him and, Joshua would stay right there with the shepherd. And they would go out on their daily journeys and they would go and they would get the grass and they would go through the valley sometime and the shepherd was right there. But Joshua began to notice something. Joshua began to notice that when they would go out, very few of the sheep, if any, would, would hang out with the shepherd. I mean, very, very few sheep, if any, would, would stay right there at the shepherd's side. In fact, he began to watch the sheep as they would kind of spread out over the, over the grassy fields and as they would get near the water, and he began to watch them. And then he began to really notice something. He, he saw a tree line, right? There was a tree line out there, and, and he became very curious about that tree line. Now, there were other sheep, and they, they, they weren't really going to the tree line, but they were, they were getting closer, and they were out there. And Joshua began to wonder, was he missing out on something? I mean, was there something out near that tree line? Was there something beyond that tree line that was something he wanted to explore? I mean, was he missing out on something? And the shepherd began to notice as they would, as the days went on and on, and the days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months, he began to notice that Joshua didn't hang out by his side as much as he used to. And as the days went by, he began to see Joshua go a little further away and get a little closer to that tree line. Now, of course, Joshua didn't have the view that the shepherd had. Joshua didn't have the understanding that the shepherd had. Joshua had no idea that nearing that tree line was a dangerous thing. Joshua had no idea that crossing into that tree line was a deadly thing. He had no idea that there were coyotes and that there were wolves and that there were mountain lions and he had no idea that there were steep cliffs and, and rushing waters. He had no idea. The shepherd knew that. The shepherd had a different view than Joshua did. Well, Joshua continued, wondering what was in that tree line. Why were the other sheep so close? And he just kept going and going and getting closer. And, and at first, the shepherd would, would call him back, and Joshua would come back to the shepherd. And, and then the shepherd found himself having to call a little louder and a little louder. And eventually, the shepherd pursued Joshua and, and went out there and, and took his staff, as, as a good shepherd would do, and, and put it around his neck and would pull him and try to guide him and turn him back. And he had to use a little more force, and, and, and at times, he had to jerk pretty hard on his staff. And, and yet, Joshua did not seem... To be listening. Joshua did not seem to be responding to what the shepherd wanted. One day, the shepherd noticed that Joshua had gone further than he had ever gone before. He, he was closer to the tree line than he had ever been. And as the shepherd went out and got Joshua and brought him back one more time, the shepherd began to, tears began to run down the shepherd's face. Because the shepherd realized at that point what was going to have to happen if he was going to get Joshua's attention. And so that night they got back to the foal and 
rather than allow Joshua to go in with the rest of the sheep, he kept Joshua out and actually picked him up and carried him into the barn. Sat down with him. Joshua had really no idea what was going on other than that he loved the shepherd still. Even though he had gone for the tree line multiple times, he still loved the shepherd. And the shepherd sat there and and began to just pet him a little bit and, and talk to him and tell him how much he loved him. But Joshua noticed something Uh, Very in particular, and that was as the shepherd continued to tell him that he loved him and how much he loved him, the tears just began to stream down the shepherd's face. The shepherd continued to pet Joshua, but then the shepherd took Joshua's leg and he snapped it. Snapped it in half. Joshua bleated out a cry of pain. Now let me tell you what the shepherd didn't do. The shepherd didn't stand up and throw Joshua over in a corner and say, hey, here's a blanket. When that leg heals, maybe you'll learn to stay next to me. That's not what the shepherd did. Because you see, the shepherd loved Joshua. The shepherd knew that he was going to have to use a temporary, a short-term hurt to prevent Joshua from experiencing a long-term hurt. Harm. He knew the extent of the harm. He knew what awaited Joshua beyond that tree line. And he knew that the pain that Joshua was going to experience and the the disability, at least for a while, that Joshua was going to experience was far short term in regards to what could happen to him if he didn't listen to the shepherd. The shepherd wrapped his leg up, put bandages on it, put oil on it. He carried him over and, and laid him down in a fresh stall with hay and made sure that he was warm and The shepherd told him that he loved him and came back the next morning. The shepherd made sure that he was okay. And the shepherd knew that he had to take care of the rest of the sheep. Knew that he was going to go on the day's journey. And he didn't leave Joshua behind. He picked Joshua up and he put him over his shoulders. If you can picture that shepherd with a a lamb or almost a full-grown sheep over his shoulders now. Imagine the the difficulty that 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 provided for the shepherd. Having to go about the same job, doing all the same work with the sheep, and yet bearing Joshua's burden. With him, not leaving him alone. And day after day that happened. And finally came the day when the shepherd knew that Joshua's leg was healed. And he took Joshua down off of his shoulders and he took the bandage off his leg and he put Joshua on the ground. And stumbled for a little bit but realizing that his leg was, was better now. Began to walk. Now there was a little, something a little different about Joshua's walk. He had a little bit of a limp. That could be noticed if you watched. As the shepherd left the barn, began to walk to the fold to let the other sheep out, he looked down at his side and guess who was there? Joshua. Limping, but there. The shepherd went on about his day at the fold, in the valley, up in the grass. And when he would stop, he would look down and there was Joshua. Joshua remained there. By the shepherd's side. And you want to know why? Because Joshua learned through the short-term hurt that God allowed him to experience to keep him from having experienced the long-term harm, Joshua had learned that the safest place to be for any sheep, the the safest place to be is at the side of the shepherd. Now, that story means a whole lot to me. You want to know why? Because I was Joshua. I was Joshua. December of 1987, Jesus Christ became my shepherd. Now, I knew about the shepherd. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up attending church and Sunday school and Awana and Bible school. I grew up going to Christian camp and hearing some of the greatest speakers you can imagine. So, it's not that I didn't know that there was a Jesus It's not that I didn't know what Jesus had done for me. It's not that I didn't even know that I needed to surrender my life to him, surrender my heart to him. I just didn't. I I guess maybe I thought I did. I made a decision in what my mom calls tot time. I don't remember it very well. All I know is that in ninth grade as I sat in chapel at Cross Lanes Christian School and heard Tom Farrell begin to talk about the difference between heaven and hell and why one is not good and one is, and how we can get from one to the other through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I just remember the Holy Spirit saying to me, you may know about the shepherd, but knowing about the shepherd is not going to get you to the shepherd's house for all eternity. You must know the shepherd. You must have a relationship with the shepherd. And so therefore, on that day in December of 1987, I cried out to the Lord, cried out to the Lord for forgiveness. I admitted that I was a sinner. 
I believed with all my heart that God had raised him from the dead as the Savior of the world. And I chose. I chose to give him my heart. I chose to give him my life. I chose for him to become my shepherd on that day. Now, I look over the audience today. I know some of you. I know some of you very well. Throughout the last three years, I've had the privilege of being your pastor. Some of you in here I've met for the very first time. So I don't know all of your hearts. That's for sure. I'm not God. There might be sitting somebody out here today who, like me, back in 1987, you know a lot about Jesus. You know a lot about the shepherd. You may know a lot about his word. You may know a lot about church. You may know a lot about a relationship with that shepherd. And yet today, the Holy Spirit brought you here because he needed to let you know that knowing about The shepherd is not going to allow you to spend eternity with the shepherd in heaven. But that you must know the shepherd. You must have a relationship with the shepherd. As the Bible says, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. This morning, what I'm talking about is surrendering all. And where surrendering all starts is in your relationship with God. If you are not one of the sheep, if you are not one of the lambs in his flock, then you do not have a relationship with the shepherd. He does not know you. And in Matthew 7, God makes it very clear when someone stands before him one day, and we all will stand before him one day, when someone stands before him one day, and you don't know him, you don't have a relationship with him, You haven't done the will of the Father, which is to claim that relationship by admitting that you're a sinner, believing that God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son into this world to die for your sins. If you've not claimed that, then the Lord's going to look at you. God's going to look at you. It says in the word of God, and he's going to say this, depart from me. I never knew you. And at that point in time, it's not going to matter that the offer For him to be your shepherd, the offer for him to be your savior, the offer for you to surrender all. It's not going to matter that you had that. What's going to matter is that you did nothing with it, that you did not make that first choice. You did not surrender your heart to him. And you're going to spend eternity in a place that the Bible calls the lake of fire. The Bible calls it eternal torment. The Bible calls it the second death. And as you have heard me say so many times, second death does not mean non-existence. I wish that's what it meant because it would be better for any of us to experience non-existence, to go into a state where we just aren't anymore than it would be to experience a conscious external, I'm sorry, conscious eternal existence without God. Without God. I, I can't even begin to describe to you how, what a state of torment that will be. But here's what I can describe for you is the love of God. And the fact that he loves you so much that the Bible makes it clear that he does not desire that anyone experience that. But that all experience his salvation. That all experience the gift that he has given. So that's where surrender starts. I surrender all starts by us bowing the knee of our heart and life to Jesus Christ, to God, and saying, I am a sinner. We must admit that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then believing, believing that God loved you so much he sent his son to pay the price for those sins. And then see, because there's a lot of people that have admitted they're sinners. There's a lot of people that believe there's a God. Do you know that Satan believes there's a God? But they've skipped the very important step of choosing. See is choosing. We must choose to give him our heart and our lives. We must choose to say, Lord, you gave your life for me. I want all of what you got. And Lord... In doing that, you have bought me with a price. And so therefore, here's what you bought. Here's my life. Here's all of me. Take it. I surrender all. I pray that today, if the Holy Spirit brought you here because you find yourself in that group, that up until December of 1987, the group that I was a member of, a membership that was, hey, I know a whole lot about God, but I don't know God. I know a whole lot about Jesus, but I don't know Jesus. I know a whole lot about the great shepherd, but I don't know the shepherd. But on that day, I surrendered my heart and my life. Now, I wish I could say 
From that point in, in December of 1987 until today, this day in October of 2014, I wish I could say that I, I had walked the straight and narrow, that I had followed the Lord, that I had, that I had unlike Joshua, never started to stray from the shepherd's side. I wish that was me, but it's not. I, I was a Joshua. So now let's talk about group two. And group two is a very greatly populated group. In the church, it's a very greatly populated group, especially in the church of the United States of America. You want to know what it is? It's the group of people that are like Joshua. We know who our shepherd is. We have claimed him as our shepherd. There was a time, and you might have that time and date written in your Bible. There was a time when you gave him your heart and you gave him your life. And there's nothing you can do to give that back. The Bible says he holds us in his hand. And that he won't ever turn loose of us. You, you can't give back something that you never earned. And yet you belong to the same group that I belonged to for the longest time. And that was this. Yes, Lord, I, I gave you my heart and I gave you my life. You were my Savior and Lord. I still need you as my Savior. But as far as the Lord thing goes, I want to take charge for a while. Now, God, I know that you tell me in Jeremiah 29, Lord, I know you say, for I know, and this is God speaking, I know the plans I have for you, Rob, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But I know in my life I was like, Lord, how can that be? How can you, the God of eternity, possibly know what's better for me? I mean, it's my life, right? I know the plan that I have for my life, Lord. I wanted to do this, and God wanted me to do this. And I said, I want to do this. And God says, I want you to do this. Now, because I had a relationship with the Lord and because the Holy Spirit was inside of me, meaning that God, the Spirit, lived in me, that's how I knew God had something else for me. You know what I'm talking about. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and whether it's just a one-time thing or whether you're walking a path of sin, the Holy Spirit convicts you. That's part of the evidence that you're a Christian is when the Holy Spirit lets you know, hey, you're going the wrong way. You're going a different way than the way God wants. And that's what the Lord was saying to me. I knew that God had something special for me. Special in the fact that not that I'm special, but like Abraham, he wanted to use me. Like Moses, he wanted to use me. Uh, like David, he wanted to use me. It's just that what he wanted to use me for and what I wanted were two different things. You see, I wanted to fly fighter jets for the Air Force. That's all I ever wanted to do. When I was little, every now and then I would dress up like the Lone Ranger or Superman or Space Ghost. My mom even let me draw black squares on my pajamas so I could push buttons like I was Space Ghost. Many of y'all don't remember Space Ghost. Anybody remember Space Ghost? Space Ghost was a cool superhero. Thank you, JR. I'm, I'm getting old now. I know that. But most of the time what I was playing was fighter jet pilot because that's what I wanted to do. I had it all planned out. I was going to go through high school. I was going to do great. I was a member of the Civil Air Patrol. I was going to go to the Air Force Academy, and I was going to fly fighter jets. It, case closed, period. That's what I was going to do. Now, before I go any further, let me make sure I say this. There's nothing wrong with dreams. There's nothing wrong with goals. There's nothing wrong with aspirations. There's nothing wrong with you sitting there as a young person or even as an older person saying, God, I desire this in my life. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's where it becomes wrong. When we're unwilling to say, God, this is what I want. Is it what you want? God, is my want in accordance with your word? Is my want in accordance with your will? And if your want is in accordance with his word, because if it goes against his word, I guarantee it goes against his will. So if, if, if you're, what you want goes in accordance with his word and what you want goes in accordance with his will as you are praying to him and getting a peace by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, and let me make sure you understand something, you can't be living in sin and expect to hear God's will. You can't. If you are living in sin like I was because I was rebelling the Lord, I was, you, you can't begin to say, well, hey, Lord, uh, is this your will? Show me your will until you say, Lord, show me your forgiveness. You see, the only thing that clears up communication with headquarters is asking him to forgive you for straying from him. Now, I was really good, right? I still went to church. I still went to Sunday school. I still went to Awana. A lot of it was because I had no choice, right? I, I grew up with a drug problem. My parents drug me to church every time the doors were open. Every time the doors were open. But it didn't matter 
Because it was what was in the heart that mattered. It didn't matter how many memory verses I could say. It didn't matter how mannerly I was. It didn't ma- None of that mattered. What mattered is that I wanted to go this way and God wanted me to go this way. It's like Jonah. And no matter how much God said through teachers, through friends, through people in my Sunday school class, through my parents, through the godly preaching that I grew up under, no matter what God said, it was all okay until God started talking about my future. Until God started saying to me, like with Abraham, hey, I need you to be willing to lay it all on the altar. Because I knew, I didn't want to lay it on the altar, because I knew that the Holy Spirit directing me that what I was going to lay on the altar, God was going to burn up. Meaning, God did not want me to fly fighter jets. And that's why it was wrong. Not because there was anything wrong with me pursuing that dream. The problem with it is that I was not following my shepherd. The shepherd wanted me to go this way, away from that tree line. And I wanted to go closer and closer to the tree line. And like in the story of Joshua, the shepherd uh, used multiple tools to try to get my attention. Friends, my parents, teachers, messages from God's word. And at times I would feel the conviction of the Lord, but then I would harden my heart because I knew what I wanted And what I wanted and the thing that I wanted, I let go past how important it was to surrender, to follow what God wanted. All I could see was short term, the short term tree line. God had a view and he knew what he had for me. He knew what he wanted me to do. He knew that one day he wanted me to stand at Lighthouse Baptist Church having been the, had, the, had the honor of being your pastor for three years. He wanted me to stand here and glorify him. But I didn't want that and that's nothing against you. Nothing against the multiple churches that I've served in since the Lord got my attention. I just wanted what I wanted. So I pursued what I wanted. And in December of 1990, I got a letter, a very important letter from Congressman at that time, Congressman Bob Wise from the state of West Virginia saying, Congratulations, Mr. Vernon. You are bearing one of my nominations. This is a big trophy. One of my few nominations to the United States Air Force Academy. Woohoo! Man, this has to be a God thing. Why? Well, because it was an open door. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an open door. Can I tell you something? If you're living by the open door, closed door philosophy, and yet you're not following the Lord, it doesn't work. You want to know why that door opened? The door opened because I had kicked it down. I had used a crowbar to keep it open. I was pursuing what God did not want. Don't think that just because, hey, this door opened, it must be from God. Really? Have you asked him? If you're standing right now getting ready to enter through a doorway, you need to stop and ask yourself, just because this door is open, does God God want me to go through it? Maybe you're standing in the doorway, but maybe you're standing in the opposite direction of God's will. I don't know. Just don't be making any major decisions in your life that require walking through an open door if you haven't been pursuing God's will, because I surely hadn't. I didn't want to pursue God's will because I knew what he was going to say. Don't go through that door. Don't even open that door. Well, God continued to try. In May of 1991, I got a letter from the Air Force Academy. Mr. Vernon, we regret to inform you that even though you made it through the selection process and were a nomination to the Air Force Academy, we're going to deny you admission. Now, here's what should have happened. I should have fallen on my knees at that point and said, Father, I know this road that I'm pursuing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt it hasn't been your will. I know that. Forgive me for continuing to follow this road. Thank you for closing the door that I broke down. Show me now, Lord, no matter what it takes, if it means sitting idle for a year, you showing me where you want me to go, what you want me to do. But that's not what I did. You see, I'm a very persistent individual. I'm a very uh, task-oriented. You tell me that I can't do something, and I'm going to show you that I can. And that can be a good quality. It was given to me by the Lord. But I'm telling you right now, at this point in time, I wasn't using it for his glory. And all I said was, I never let my knees touch the floor. I said, that's okay. Air Force Academy shut the door. I will open another one. I will climb over another wall. I'll do whatever it takes to get what I want. You've been there. I know you have. We're all sinners. We all have a desire in our nature to pursue what we want even when God makes it clear that's not his will. Somebody sitting out here today who even right now may be pursuing something. I have no no idea exactly why God brought this message to me today, why he wanted me to preach it today. 
but I do know that he wants to use it in somebody's life. So, I found a school down in Longview, Texas that had an aviation program. I applied, got a small scholarship. They let me play soccer. Hey, once again, another open door. This has to be from God, but not one time did I say, Lord, is this what you want? Lord, is this what you will? I went down there, pursued a career in aviation, pursued a degree in aviation, was doing very well. Headed into my senior year, and that summer I'd had to take some very important flight courses, which went well. And then I had to go to uh, Barksdale Air Force Base and take some tests. And as I got back to school in August and opened up my CPO box, there it was, a big packet from the Air Force. Mr. Vernon, you are fully qualified. Thank you. All that stands between you and everything you've ever wanted is eight months of school and a college diploma. Eight months of school and a college diploma was all that stood between me and Officers Candidate School. It's all that stood between me and Jet School. It's all that stood between me and what I wanted. Eight months and a diploma. Oh, and forgive me, I forgot to tell you. Also, what standed in my way was a Heavenly Father who had a broken heart and wanted his son to pay attention to his will and how it went against my wants. Now hear me, church, when I tell you this. If you are sitting here today and you're not a member of that first group, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord has saved you, that if there was a point in your life where you made him the Lord of your life and the Savior of your soul, and yet you stand here where I stood as a child of God, one of his lambs, and you're pursuing what you want, Let me not just use myself as an example. Let me use examples that are given in the Word of God. Let me give you two of them. The first is Jonah. The second is Samson. Both were children of God. Both God had a plan for. Both were interested in pursuing their wants over top of His will. In the end, God accomplished His will even though one turned, the other was taken. Y'all know the story. They both had to go through a hellish experience. And yet Jonah repented and God used him to speak his word to the city of Nineveh and lots of people came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Samson God got his attention, but only at the very end. Y'all know the story of Samson. He followed his wants instead of God's wills. And where did that lead him? It led to the tree line. It led to utter destruction. It led to Samson standing between two poles, head shaved, eyes gouged out, body weak. Did Samson have to die? I don't believe he did. I believe God could have done some awesome things through Samson If Samson had chosen what God wanted over top of what he wanted, and yet we know what happened. Did Samson pray to the Lord at the end? Yes. Did God forgive Samson? Yes. Is Samson in heaven? I believe it with all my heart. But did Samson have to die? No. You see, I believe that God either will turn you or take you. Those are his options. Those are his options. October the 1st, 1994, I climbed into my a Piper Arrow, myself and two other guys. Now, this was the coolest thing in the world because I was at college, right, where most people, you go to college, you got to sit in chemistry lab, you got to sit in math, you got to sit in all these classes. I got to sit in the cockpit of an airplane, right? I got to fly all over the country. This is what I wanted to do, and I was getting college credit for it. This was great. Climbed into the airplane, took off. We were on our way from Longview, Texas to California. We were going to make stops in Oklahoma and Arizona. We saw some of the most beautiful things there are to see. Got into California, spent the night. The next day flew out to Catalina Island. Called my roommate from Catalina Island and made fun of him because he was in chemistry lab and I was sitting on Catalina Island. I mean, how awesome is that? Flew into Las Vegas. The very next day, flew out of Las Vegas, flew down through the Grand Canyon, flew along the Snake River, did some maneuvers around that just beautiful country. Little did I know that my Heavenly Father was about to do to me what the shepherd had to do to Joshua. 
The Lord knew that he was going to have to break my leg. He was going to have to allow me to experience short-term hurt so that I would stop pursuing something that had long-term harm attached to it. We flew into Page, Arizona. I can see it like it was yesterday. We landed. I had been flying most of the day. Climbed out of the cockpit. Walked into the, uh, to the airport and did what we needed to do. As we got back into the airplane, I climbed into the back. We pulled up out of Page, Arizona. Headed into Colorado. The last thing that I remember is seeing some of the beautiful, beautiful mountains in Colorado that just make the things that we see here in southeastern Ohio, close to West Virginia, it makes it look like anthills. And that's just the truth. The rest of what I'm going to tell you was told to me by the flight instructor who was not only in the plane but was awake and alive the entire 24 hours that this happened. We began to fly into Colorado. We were headed to Leadville where we were going to do some touch and goes at the highest elevated airport in all of the United States. The weather got so bad that the flight instructor decided that we were going to change our flight plan midair and that we were going to head back to Longview, Texas. We had done enough mountain training, he felt, and we could head back home. On the way back home, we decided to do one more maneuver, and that was to fly our airplane into a box canyon. You don't really want to do this on purpose, but when you're training, you do it. So we flew into the box canyon, mountain, 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 only one way in, only one way out. We couldn't go up over the mountain. We couldn't find anything that fast or that powerful. So what you do is you slow the airplane down to the point where if you were going any slower, you would just fall out. And you slow that airplane down and you do what's called a minimum controllable airspeed turn. You turn that airplane, you can really turn it on a dime, and we were going to get out of that canyon. Well, as the flight instructor and and the other student pilot, Jeff, were up front, they began to do the maneuver. And as they did the maneuver, they got too close to one side of the mountain. We got hit with what's called a downdraft, which is very powerful wind. It hit our airplane and it took us from 3,000 feet to hitting the mountain in 20 seconds. 20 seconds. My life changed. 20 seconds, the shepherd got my attention. Now, the story should end right there, at least for me. Uh, There should be another pastor. There should be an evangelist. There should be somebody else up here telling this story because my life should be over. If you were to go out here and to get in one of your cars and you were to go down 339, however long it took you to get up to 120 miles an hour, if you could do it, and you hit something solid, Don't do this. This is an illustration. You hit something solid at 120 miles an hour and something that has electricity as well as fuel, things end right then. It doesn't matter how many airbags come out. Well, in this airplane, we had no airbags, and in this airplane, we hit the ground at 120 miles an hour. The story should be over. We had 50 gallons of avgas in each wing. We should have just erupted into a ball of flames. But here's what's really cool. Guess what? The shepherd was still in charge. Though that airplane was falling out of the sky at 120 miles an hour, the shepherd still had his hand under that airplane. He knew exactly how fast I needed to be going. He knew exactly how hard my airplane needed to hit that mountain. He knew exactly what needed to happen to get my attention. We hit the ground so hard that we indented into the ground. But we began to slide forward on sheer momentum. Now, where we hit the ground, our altimeter still read 11,500 feet. We were still high up. About 100 yards from where we started sliding was a 5,000-foot drop-off, and that's exactly what we were headed towards. But you know what? 50 years or so before, God knew exactly what he was going to use that strip of mountain for, and he allowed two big old pine trees. I like those trees. I'd like to go visit those trees because those trees, under God's direction, saved my life. If our nose had hit one of those trees, it would have split us in half. If one of our wings had hit that tree, it would have spun us off the cliff. But you know what? As if we were being directed by someone, the nose of our airplane went right in between those two trees. Did two things for us. Number one, it stopped us. Number two, it separated us from the fuel, which was a very good thing because we laid there on that mountain at 11,500 feet, October the 1st of 1994, for 24 hours. One word describes that, and that's chilly. It was cold. 11,500 feet, our cockpit was broken out. But you know what's really awesome about that? God knew that we were there. God knew that he needed to use this situation. I was in the back seat. You say, well, pastor, that's probably the safest place to be in an airplane crash. It's the safest place to be unless God's after you. 
And can I tell you something? Just like Jonah experienced when he went down to the bottom of that boat trying to get as far away from God as he could, he ex- real quick he saw that you can't run from God. God always knows where you are. We hit the ground so hard that my body was catapulted forward like this. My head basically went down between my legs. Now, my left leg, it came up around my neck. And I know we've got some medical people in here, but it came up around my neck. I might not use all the right terminology, Lori. It came up around my neck, dislocated, did a whole bunch of bad stuff. But the worst part was it was pinned up around my neck and it cut circulation off to my leg. My right leg went up underneath the pilot's seat and snapped in half at the ankle. When I mean snapped in half, it snapped bone, it snapped ligaments, it snapped blood vessels. It was just hanging there by skin. My shoulder was broken, my nose was broken, I was cut both places in my head, but the worst injury was that my L1 vertebrae exploded. The bone just exploded and it sent bone fragments all up and down my spine. I laid that way for 24 hours. 24 hours. All three of us were critically injured. The flight instructor was pinned in the airplane. The other pilot was just uh, had, had hit his head so hard on the instrument panel that he was loony. He climbed out of the airplane, passed out on the ground where he just laid there and bled uh, for 24 hours. You say, how did you survive? Well, God's in charge. God's in charge. How did I survive? That's how it happened. You see, God knew what he had to do, but he wasn't done with me yet. After 24 hours, they finally found us, and the flight instructor said, you know, when they came up on us, they were acting kind of nonchalant because they just knew that all three of us were dead. He cried out to them, letting them know that, hey, we're still in here. He had been sticking his hand around behind the seat, continuing to touch me to make sure that I was still warm, which was the only symbol of life that he had. They took us to the hospital. Now, you have to understand, with my legs being wrapped the way they were and broken the way they were for 24 hours, circulation had been cut off. Gangrene had already begun to set in. The poison from the muscles that it was killing flooded my kidneys. You all think I had kidney problems a few weeks ago. Back in October of 1994, my kidneys shut down. When they found us, I was in renal failure. They told me later that had they found me 45 minutes later, I would be dead. They got us to the hospital. The doctors, after they had Red Cross uh, flight my parents in from West Virginia to Farmington, New Mexico, the doctors told my parents, listen, your son shouldn't be alive. Duh. Your son shouldn't be alive. These are medical doctors, not pastors. They told my parents, they said, look, you need to know something. Somebody wants your son to be alive. If it had been one degree warmer, he would have bled to death. If it had been one degree colder, he would have slipped into hypothermia and died. Who holds a thermostat like that? The shepherd. The shepherd. They said, your son's alive, but we're not sure if we can keep him that way. Good thing they're not in charge. They said, we've had him on a dialysis machine seven times. He's had enough poison in his body to kill ten people. Now they said, listen, we're glad he's alive, but you need to know something. You are going to have to make a real quick decision because we need to amputate his leg. If we don't amputate his leg, that, the poison's going to kill him. One of the doctors looked at my father, who's going to be here this morning. I just think it's kind of God ironic that my parents came up the weekend that I was going to tell this story again. They looked at my father and they said, make your decision, but it really doesn't matter. Whether we amputate his leg or not, your son's never going to walk. He's never going to walk. Someone who has a spinal cord injury at that level is usually paralyzed from the waist down. Let me show you something. Does this look paralyzed? Now, I don't say that to boast in myself. I say this to boast in my shepherd, the shepherd who said, I'm not done with you yet, kid. You've run from me. You've rebelled against me. You took me off the throne and were more concerned about your wants than my will. I need your attention. Do I have it? I remember laying in hospital rooms in Charleston, West Virginia, headed for physical therapy. I remember laying there some lonely nights and crying out, God, are are you still here? And he would let me know, yeah, I'm I'm still here. I I never left. You're, You're the one that ran from me. I said, God, what do you have for me? 
He said, what I've had for you all along, my will. And my will is always better than your wants. What I need you to do, Rob, is surrender to me. Know that what I have for you is great. Know that what I have for you is awesome. Know that you continuing to pursue the tree line that you keep wanting to pursue is not a good thing. It leads to destruction. You may think you're reaping destruction right now, but I have allowed you to experience this short-term hurt to keep you from experiencing a long-term harm. Will you listen to me? Church, I believe this morning that God is crying out to some of you saying, Will you listen to me? I believe that God is here doing a work saying, look, I allowed this kid to stay alive for 20 years that he shouldn't be here because today I wanted him to say to you, are you listening to him? Are you? I wish I could say, I wish I could say that I knew for sure that if you chose not to listen to God today and whatever he's asking you to listen to him about, I wish I could say that I know that this is the last warning that he's going to give. I wish I could say that, that, I, that I knew that God's not going to do something to allow short-term hurt in your life to keep you from experiencing long-term harm, but I can't. What I can say is right now, right here, you can make a choice, a choice that if I could go back and remake, I would, but I can't. You can. You don't have to live and learn. You can listen and learn. The world says that to live and learn is one of the greatest teachers. I say fooey on that. I say right now you could be listening to someone who has already lived and learned this lesson and you could listen and learn. You could surrender what he has for you today. You could give it to him. I have no clue what you're holding on to. I have no clue what even right now you're white knuckling because you don't want to give it up. What I can say to you is that what he has for you will always be better. I am living proof of that. Now, there's one last group that's probably represented here today, and I know we're running kind of over, but that's okay. There's one last group. You've surrendered your heart. Though maybe at times you've walked a different path, at this point in time, you've surrendered your life. You love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You're pursuing Him. You want what He wants. You believe you're in His will. And yet today, you're holding on to something. What is that? Hurt. Somebody sitting out here today who has experienced hurt. In a marriage, a child, a doctor's report. And you're looking at God and you're saying, I don't understand. I gave you my heart. I'm giving you my life. I'm walking the walk you want me to walk. I'm serving you. I'm listening to you. I'm delighting myself in you, as Psalms 37, 4 says. Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? I don't understand. And you want to know what God is trying to say to you this morning? You don't have to understand. You just have to trust. I know you love me, he says. I know you're following me. I love you. But I've designed, as, as the song said, I've designed this path for you and this path right now includes this valley that I'm asking you to walk through. It includes this hurt that you're experiencing. But please know I'm here. I'm here. And I will walk this path with you. But it's going to be so much easier on you, God's trying to say, if you'll surrender. You've given me your life. You've given me your heart. Now give me your hurt. Surrender that hurt to me and trust me. The key to this morning's message is this. I surrender all. That's it. God brought you here today to reassure you maybe as you continue to surrender all to him. No doubt there might be some Christians in here this morning who have said, that's what I'm doing. Thank you, Pastor Rob, for that encouragement because I want to keep doing it. But if you're in here today and you're holding something back, be it your heart, be it your life, be it your hurt, I pray that this morning you'll surrender all to him. To stay up to date on current events at the church, check service times, or if you have questions about the Bible, please visit us at lbchurch.com or call 740-678-2738. Thanks for listening.